So as this chart shows, uh, I'm from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I work in Greenbelt, Maryland, but NASA Goddard is really a collection of about five facilities, one of the largest of which, besides the Greenbelt campus, is the WAPS Flight Facility in Virginia. So I'm, I'm really excited and honored uh, this morning to introduce Stephen Creamer. He's the Range Operations Manager at WAPS. Uh, and he'll, he'll come up and his, his talk is on uh, the management of rapid change using WALPS as a prime example. The scope of their work over the last few years has exploded. The capabilities they have and the team is just doing uh, some really amazing, amazing things that he'll talk about. But Stephen's been, uh, he started with NASA in 87 as a co-op, student co-op, and has been doing range and communications and these type of activities since then supporting not just NASA missions, but Air Force activities, NOAA activities, and other launches. He's on committees at the NASA agency level, interacting with these other government agencies, and really helping push uh, the value of this important uh, range and launch facility on, on the Eastern Shore. Uh, he has a degree, University of Maryland College Park, in, in May of 90, which is after the date he says he started with NASA, so I think that confirms the, the co-op uh, statements. He has a number of major awards uh, through the NASA agency, the NASA agency level for outstanding leadership and support over these years. So I think we'll just have him come up and, and show you what's going on at Wallops. Stephen. My name is Steve Premer. I am the chief of the uh, NASA's only launch range uh, at Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. And uh, I sometimes get, you know, wh where, where the heck is that? But that's okay. That's okay. Um, we've been launching rockets there for uh, about 70 years, and we've had a lot of practice. Uh, but our landscape's changed over those 70 years. And uh, with that, uh, has, we've had to change the way we approach things. And uh, what I, that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you about today, about how do you adapt to that change. Um, it doesn't involve finding necessarily the uh, best solution for today's problems. It, it's more about finding the hardest problem and then uh, building a solution for that. And so I'll touch briefly on our history, uh, then I'll discuss a need for a flexible organization, the uh, flexible systems architectures that have to go along with that, uh, what partnerships mean to a flexible architecture, a few keys to our successes, and um, how, they, how limitations can actually add value if you know what those limitations are up front and how you go about doing that. And a little bit of forward uh, momentum thinking uh, that we can take away, hopefully. Uh, you won't find me reading my slides, uh, words. I'm gonna go through these kind of quick, and, uh, but I will um, tell you a little bit of the story that's behind the slide, which I think is more important for the audience today. So I want to go a little bit over the history, um, the overview of Wallops, and uh, then I'll go over that. Um, next slide, please. So um, this video shows we were established in, in 1945. Um, we've conducted over 16,000 launches from Wallops over that period. And we provided launch tracking and data operations for uh, the uh, the history um, of that time. I mean, it's it's been quite involved in what we've done and how it's changed in the landscape. But for all of our missions over our lifetime, or our life at Wallops, including some of those that some in the audience, at least at my age, have heard with Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, um, even Shuttle. And but you know now we're supporting the readiness of our warfighter and uh, mission readiness for new weapon systems testing at Wallops, and sending cargo to the International Space Station. All that's going on at Wallops today. A quite a diverse portfolio. And our mission has changed, but you know, so have we. And I found that clicker, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, our mission at Wallops is, is as I said, is to provide a, a world-class operational test and evaluation environment uh, for the nation, not just NASA. And while we are indeed a NASA installation, our capabilities support worldwide operations also. Uh, for NASA, DOD, commercial organizations, and also uh, educational institutions. So we have two main land areas at Wallops. The main base where a lot of the integration and test is done. It's about where 95% of our employees are located. 
And then about seven miles away along the coast is where we have our launch site. We have an ELV integration facility there, um, a major Navy tenant organization also. Uh, our sounding rocket launch areas are there and also two ELV launch pads are there and I'll go into a little bit of how they apply to our work. So this slide, you know, th this is when I say, when I say flexibility, this is what I mean. Um, it shows that uh, we need to be unlike any other space launch range there is out there. Uh, the diversity of our customer set uh, at Wallops is truly unique. Uh, as you can see, we support all of NASA's mission directorates, but 30% of our work comes from outside of NASA. And what that means is while we need to keep our eye on not only what I call our parent, which is NASA, uh, we also need to keep our eye on what our rich uncle needs, which otherwise known as the DOD in my eye. So uh, you all may not think the same, but I do, uh, compared to the money I get from NASA. So you know that, that, that's, a, that's a little bit different strategic view that you need to keep when you're developing new systems architectures and focusing on what you can not only do today for your current customer, but what you might be able to be asked to do tomorrow. Um, our approach to uh, technology development and systems engineering and architecture decisions, uh, they need to be strategically focused on matters that are uh, perhaps not only in NASA's best interest, as I said, but rest assured, uh, my NASA friends in the audience, they're, uh, if you do this right, it's, it's better for everyone. And I'll touch on a little bit of that later. Um, just a few pictures here and it notes our diverse capabilities and customer set, but what I want to focus on is how do you meet that diverse customer set? And w which means, uh, you know, every evolving set of requirements and how you do, how do you economically build this flexibility in a way that's truly sustainable? Um, whether you're building a capability uh, like we uh, have at Wallops or you're building the next generation data processing or distribution system, uh, these are questions that have to be answered and have to be dealt with definitely over the, uh, the, within the bounds of your program itself. So I'm a member of an executive committee on the Range Commanders Council. Last week at White Sands Missile Range, we had the range commanders of over 16 ranges here in the U.S. And uh, it was a pretty consistent thought coming from every one of those commanders, and it was, what are we going to do with big data? And I saw that mentioned yesterday a number of times. You know, and they mean everything from acquisition to processing, uh, to distribution, storage, analysis, uh, archive. But, you know, this, while this seemed to be the biggest things on their mind, uh, other than maybe information security and cybersecurity, um, I'm confident, after, especially after what I heard yesterday, all of you all out there are going to be the solution. To that problem that they have. Um, it, it's a big problem in the test and training ranges. So I want to go a little bit over the flexible organization and how that supports a flexible architecture. Um, at Wallops we have something that's pretty unique and that's our suborbital program. Uh, so we have varying customers for those. It's not just NASA. Uh, with varying rocket platforms it requires to launch from just about any corner of the globe and I'll go into how we support that effort. And that's just for our rocket customers. We have UAVs, we have aircraft, we have high altitude balloons. So you can imagine how that plays into the needs of a flexible ground system architecture. And what that means is um, it's, flexibility is not the only game in town that you have to keep in mind. It, it also needs to be responsive. And I know you all are also in that same game. So just like the warfighter's needs, uh, a science event in space is often un unanticipated. And uh, we have to be not uh, and often not able to be observed in advance or in, and also you can't just take that requirement to any location in the world so even in the department of defense world where you don't know where that issue may occur we also don't in a science world so we have to have that same mindset uh, what comes with developing a ground system architecture that's flexible is also the need to adapt to unplanned circumstances and you may think that you're handed all the requirements up front for most missions but that doesn't mean the solutions need to be limited to those capabilities. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really stress upon that point today and how that plays into a successful outcome. I know that costs a lot of money when you want to think about added capabilities and things that might come around the corner in the future. But it, it, it may pay off in the long run if it's done right. So always give that option, though, to your customer. Um, the cost-benefit analysis uh, is your solution. But don't hide it because transparency 
uh, accuracy and realism are your friends as you go down that path. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a video. If you can go ahead and play the video, uh, ma'am, and then um, I wanna go into this a little bit. So, one of our more challenging and unique missions at Wallops is uh, sounding rocket salvo missions. This is one we did for missile defense and uh, BMD program within the Navy. So we launched three rockets in succession within 20 seconds. Normally would not be a challenge, but we have to acquire data from all three of those and radar tracking data in addition to telemetry from all those while they're in the air at the same time. And our safety office has to also have tracking of all the components, not just the uh, payload section itself. So we have to have booster tracking and everything. So it really, really stresses, you know, I'm usually in a good situation at a range where we have plenty of backup. But when you have seven or eight things in the air, and we do, do not have multiple object tracking radars, when you have seven or, things in, uh, seven or eight things in the air at one time, you have to track for safety reasons and for mission assurance, it becomes mightily stressful because you no longer have that backup in your back pocket. So, um, you know, the mission launched three sounding rockets uh, to simulate engagement of a missile against U.S. Navy ships. And the, uh, these ARAV vehicles, or uh, Aegis Readiness Assessment vehicles, were launched and served as as the test for that day uh, while we had ships offshore. So the mission alone, you can find compressed schedules. It should sound very familiar to what, you, what you're dealing with. Uh, unknown technology performance risks in the payload itself. Uh, unplanned budgets, given our customer was not non-NASA. So the availability of funds was gonna be based on how well I did my cost estimate on their mission requirements. A ground system arch architecture also stresses due to the number of targets in the air, as I spoke about. And these same baseline risks wouldn't be similar. Uh, they'd be similar across many of the ground systems architectures that I'm sure you're working on today. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you these risks are common probably to all of us, uh, but the mitigations that you take may be a little bit different. Also, um, there's another ex uh, element from a wallops perspective, and that's our architecture flexibility. So we have performance environment diversity also, which becomes a big issue at Wallops because of uh, where we have to deploy to. <clears throat> we have to deploy to uh, some pretty harsh locations in Norway and Alaska. We go to uh, other places, but we go to those pretty much every year. We uh, adapt deployment plans to meet these de uh, demands. It requires a lot of pre-planning, a lot of relationships with other organizations um, for sighting, and staff that's willing to be away from their families for long periods of time, many months usually. Um, and don't underestimate that component of your team. Uh, it, it, it can become huge. Uh, the common theme and what may seem like a technical challenge, though, is often people. Uh, no matter what you're developing, always keep, keep your top priority there is, is, is the people in your development team. Um, the people who will be using it when you deploy it in an operational environment also, those are the folks you need to always be, that, that need to be kept happy. Um, they need to be kept happy today, and they need to be kept happy tomorrow when you're thinking about what you're doing, because if not, it's gonna make you unhappy today and tomorrow, no doubt. <clears throat> so another aspect is of the rapid expansion at Wallops is that we're sort of still in the middle of. It's not just the addition of our major expendable launch vehicle customer in orbital ATK, which is launching missions to the space station. That's the one that's most prevalent. But the expansion itself brought on new capabilities at Wallops that for instance, in vehicle systems processing, uh, spacecraft and payload processing, uh, hazardous payload fueling operations. But our ground systems it's themselves, uh, additions, were not just, uh, not just new to us at Wallops. They were very different than what we were accustomed to historically. So adapting to that was also a big change when your mission changes. So I spoke about the value of partnerships and the commercial resupply services program effort at Wallops. Again, again as, as evidenced by this slide, brought about a lot of new partnerships. And um, it's turned into really opportunities that we didn't foresee in the future that have nothing to do with the commercial resupply mission that NASA supports. So keep in mind that as you, as you do develop architectures, 
it's not just the system that you're developing, it's also the um, team alongside you developing those solutions. And they'll end up being your solution for, uh, for items in the future also, as evidenced by uh, what happened at Wallops over the years and how we've developed those partnerships and maintained those relationships to help us solve solutions in the future. This was certainly uh, one of them. This is another example. So we had to develop a completely new partnership with the government of Bermuda. Uh, very challenging to us uh, through the Department of State uh, to establish a mobile tracking and command site in Bermuda in support of the uh, Antares launches out of Wallops. So in, in, in addition to developing a very robust system for uh, range safety needs, we also had to put together a communications architecture. But we did so with the future in mind, and I think that's evidenced by the success of that by other customers such as NASA Space Launch System coming to us and see if we can support them out of Bermuda. It becomes a, a very effective, again, a new partnership in thinking a little bit ahead about do you just meet your current requirements or can you go a little bit further? So keep that future in mind as you develop a solution for today. Um, it'll definitely serve you. Um, the Orb 3 failure that most of you are aware that was uh, in the news in October of uh, 2014 is another big item to remember that with success also comes failure. It can be a day setback in a software development item or it can be something like we experienced, uh, especially in the high risk environment. And when I mean high risk, I don't m just mean when you're launching uh, rockets that can hurt people. Um, high risk environment is the things you are developing, cutting edge technologies, that's high risk in itself. So when you have setbacks, you have to recover from those and the way in which you do that. So this one was a big, a big one for us. If you can go ahead and play that, it's just a short video. And it's <laughs> So Dan, that's the exploding part I was talking about. Um, that, was a, that was a big one for us. Um, and it was also a big one for our customer in Orbital ATK. Um, you know, launch ranges need to be great on, uh, on, on normal days, but they need to be spectacular on days like that. Uh, and we were, we didn't have any, any people hurt. Uh, any damages that occurred were easily fixed. Um, they finished that a long time ago, um, but that's, that's the same that you have for your teams. You need to, you need to have leaders that stand up and they're great uh, when bad things happen. That'll get you to the, to the finish line much sooner. So remember that in your development programs. Um, be prepared for those big setbacks and recover from those. Um, uh, how you recover from those also is gonna determine your future success. Um, the, the Wallops Airfield, pretty unique. It's just another dynamic and heavily used uh, component of the range. Uh, the airfield is a pretty flexible environment. We have flat and level portions of the airfield that we use, that we flood and actually use for water ingesting to qualify different aircraft for uh, FAA certification. We have areas that we actually have a lot of grooves cut in at varying depths and distances apart for runway friction. And we also have some unique lighting systems on the runway that we use uh, for our U.S. Navy customer to certify uh, U.S. Naval area aviators before they're uh, deployed to carrier landings. The NASA's balloon program, which is also managed out of Wallops, is quite impressive if you're not uh, familiar with it. Uh, again, worldwide mission support requirements levied upon us. Uh, flexibility and adapti adaptability in the ground systems architectures for them is, is quite remarkable and quite a challenge. Um, it's pretty unparalleled uh, when you think about what the NASA balloon program requires. Um, so just as a, an example, they're going to launch from Antarctica, New Zealand, and Sweden this year, all in the same year. They'll take payloads that can weigh uh, over 8,000 pounds up to 120,000 feet, and they can stay there for 50 plus days uh, circumnavigating the globe. It's pretty incredible science that they can do carrying very large telescopes. But you can imagine uh, what it does to our ground systems uh, stresses. And you know, it's gotta survive in an, an environment 
that is uh, less than hospitable, hospitable with those global locations. So that again comes into how we forward think and develop ground systems that can support a customer like this. So I want to talk a little bit about the backbone of that flexibility and uh, a little bit uniqueness about wallets, but I know it's going to apply to what you all are doing today also. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly, and um, so I'm not here to educate you necessarily on the specific assets of wallets. So I don't want to do that, uh, but just bear with me as I go through this because I think um, the story will come together in the end. So as, as most ranges have, we have an array of on-site processing and uh, and control center capabilities to support a wide range of customers. Uh, we have uh, fixed telemetry assets that we can also support our customers that launch out of wallops. We have meteorological and uh, uh, telemetry systems also. Uh, we have optical tracking assets also that go through. But here's the unique part. The unique part is the, is the mobile, I don't know what's advancing these slides, but I'll say there. <laughs> I would intend to go that fast, the, uh, is our mobile assets. Our mobile assets at Wallops are really what make us unique, and it, it allows us to deploy to locations around the world that support our customer needs that always come at us from, uh, from right field. Uh, but you know, we're, we're constantly called on by NASA, DOD, and others, uh, even commercial customers, to support those needs. But in that mobile, app, that mobile architecture is what enables us to do that. But, our, our truly, flexi truly flexible nature at Wallops is, is depicted by not only the mobile assets, but I'm going to go into the people side that it requires to do that. Um, another capability, the, the implementation of that quick mobility was when we set up this system in Bermuda that uh, was required to support the Antares mission that I just discussed. We had to put a, uh, a capability in Bermuda to support a range safety requirement for downrange, and getting that system fielded, certified, uh, on a foreign on foreign soil in such quick order was an example of of how you build a team that uh, thinks about flexibility and rapid uh, flexibility in their architecture development really can pay off. Also, an example is when we have to go to uh, Alaska. You know, this is um, the our need to launch in Alaska for NASA's Earth Science Program and Space Science Discoveries is um, is pretty unique, but it's often unanticipated. The something, you know, you can go to Alaska and you can be sitting there and waiting for two months for the right science event to occur for the, for the principal investigator. And I don't mean to offend any principal investigators in the room, but when they go up and look, they have to have the, the exact right color of the aurora before they're going to launch into it. I don't know anything about it. I don't claim to, but, you know, when I use terms like ionospheric phytoplankton, they don't look happy, but that's... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it, I, I'm just there to do a job, but boy, it's frustrating. They, they're uh, they're uh, probably one of our mo most challenging customers that we have. However, the most rewarding, because the papers I see coming out of them and their grad students and the educational opportunities that it provides is pretty unparalleled. Uh, I talked a little bit about our partnerships at Wallops, and that's the key to our flexibility. It really is the mobility and then the partnerships. Um, the the U.S. Navy contingent that we have at Wallops is, is an example of that. So I mentioned the U.S. Navy carrier landing partner that uses our runway. Um, they're mutually in investing with NASA over $15 million to resurface our runways at Wallops. And, you know, that's, that's the value of a partner, a monetary investment in exchange for quality services. Uh, one of our tenants at Wallops, the U.S. Navy uh, Surface Combat Systems Center, so they're pretty much autonomous to us in conducting their mission at Wallops, but they're very powerful force when it comes to um, garner political support for our installation's needs, uh, like beach replenishment, which we uh, often re require, whether that's due to hurricanes or storm events. But, so what's the value in that partnership? And that's, that's basically the value is, is the political investment that they provide in exchange for quality services. And then finally, our U.S. Navy Patuxent River customer that we have, an incredible partner that we have. Uh, you know, our range supports their needs out over the warning areas in the Atlantic. And they frequently support us by finding excess systems out there that the DOD no longer needs that we can use at Wallops to support our um, future mission needs. And that's a great, that's a great thing. The, the partnerships we have with our Navy 
uh, locally at Wallops and also at Patuxent River and also with the uh, field carrier landing folks are, are pretty are pretty incredible and enable us to do more that we would not be able to do otherwise. So good partnerships, you know, with the value in that partner, obviously with Patuxent River is, is te technical investment. So the, you know, you're, you're starting to see the pattern that those good partnerships that you all can have uh, can turn into your strategic investors, no doubt, in the future. So Mars and Orbital ATK, so our partnership with the local Commonwealth of Virginia is also a great one and also one that it should be recognized. It's pretty unique in the agency. And what they did to augment our ground systems capabilities at Wallops in response to an emerging requirement was nothing that we could have responded to in the way that they did by now having two ELV launch capabilities at Wallops, one primarily dedicated to uh, solids and one uh, dedicated to liquids. And they're not, they are very, very flexible in their implementation. It's not just the Antares launch vehicle c that can launch from that launch mount. And uh, it's not just a Minotaur class vehicle that can launch from the, uh, from the solid. So that kind of thinking about forward looking is really paying off. Other centers also, and um, our partnership with JPL, those of you all in the audience from JPL may recognize some of the photos in here. The low density supersonic decelerator uh, which you see in the in the lower right and then the, in the middle at the top was a is is a great effort going on with Wallops. Uh, JPL came to us and said, you know, we we need a little bit of uh, expertise from you on high altitude balloons and how to do range operations, and that's been nothing but a success. We always go through technical challenges on missions as we're doing on this, but uh, we're regrouping as a group and and uh, figuring out how we can keep going forward, and that's been truly. Uh, us partnering with JPL has been eye-opening to us as far as how to manage projects differently and how to manage projects with a little bit more rigor, and that's been really, really good for Wallops. Also, our NOAA component at Wallops, there is a major downlink uh, location there, as most of you know, for the GOES satellites. The partnership with GOES or with NOAA has been is pretty remarkable also because it enables us as a range to get some weather data a little bit quicker than we normally would. Again starting to see a, a, a pattern here in the value of partnerships. So finally, a little bit of key on successes. Um, so let's summarize those. And uh, how do you respond to that rapid growth? And how do you meet unanticipated requirements and to achieve consistent long-term success? So one of the items, one of the keys to our successes are definitely our knowledgeable staff. Um, it's a you have to comprise your teams of people that are essentially work ethic practitioners, I think I want to say, but also have a strong sense of community. You've, um, th that, that comprised together seems to always overcome adversity for us. Secondly, leaders must always recognize those high performers. It's very important for those of you are that are leaders of teams or organizations. Uh, Provide an environment of learning also, which I saw yesterday, which was quite remarkable of about all the things that you all are doing for outreach. And that always makes people want to strive for more. So again, always remember to um, invest in your people. A little bit of selective upgrading. Um, and I want to say selective. What I mean from that is it's got to be targeted. Uh, technology insertion should be done with today's needs, but also the future needs, as I said earlier. So our major, major range control center upgrade that we're doing is being done after 25 plus years of use of our existing control center. And some may say, well, wow, I, 25 years, that's how have you gone that long and not touched that system? That's a shame. Actually, it's not. If you look back at the engineers and, and, the, and the technicians who put that plan together and how to put that control center together back in the 80s, it, it, it is pretty remarkable that in the late 80s they were thinking so far ahead that with the massive amount of change that I've gone over today that's happened at Wallops, that control center is still relevant and it still functions today. The upgrades we're doing today is for what we, what we want to think about the next 30 years. So it's pretty remarkable and that way of thinking uh, shows that it pays off. Also upgrading at Wallops. Um, it can really mean inheriting probably the spoils of others. And uh, I'm not saying we're dumpster divers at Wallops, but we're not far from it. And uh, with, but with those relationships and with operational tests and training ranges in the U.S., we're able to gain ownership of some pretty incredible systems uh, that they no longer need. Some are practically new. Um, yet another way to economically prepare yourself for the future, again, is with those partnerships. Uh, ground systems don't need to be new. They just need to be effective 
economical, reliable, and, and, and definitely scalable. Uh, applying most, uh, as most of you know, um, ground systems architectures are, are truly software intensive. And as we all already heard definitely this week, uh, applying smart growth in the areas of software uh, technology adds flexibility definitely and reliability uh, that was unheard of when I was younger. And so, you know, what's that smart growth, smart growth technology going to be 25 years from now? Uh, that's what we need to be thinking about today. You know, today it's software, may not be in 25 years, but we need to be thinking about that rather than reacting to it. Again, I've spoken a lot about affordability. Uh, meet the requirements and then provide that accurate assessment to your customer. The transparent cost-benefit analysis for strategic enhancements is, uh, could enable that system to live longer and, and meet those emerging requirements. That, that's something that must be done as you're, as you're working through your development life cycle. So finally, a little bit about roadblocks. I'm almost done. Um, efforts always have setbacks, and we all live in that world, whether we're uh, launching rockets or supporting new uh, development systems. So in my world, you never know what could be out there as a setback. Uh, that truly could ruin your day. Uh, I've gone over one that isn't obvious when you're on a launch range environment, but you know I could have boats sitting right in the middle of a hazard area on an otherwise perfect launch day. Um, they never set in the middle of a hazard area when something else is causing me not to launch, it seems. Um, the, the other thing is that could get a political push or shove to support our nation's uh, energy independence by having offshore oil or, or wind farms right in the middle of the hazard area. So, you know, those kind of things definitely can, can serve as, as challenges or setbacks. These are all hypothetical, of course, in case there's any folks in the audience. Uh, but or I could have a perfect cost savings solution like the one in Bermuda where I'm trying to field systems to Bermuda in a little bit different way, but it could be tied up in bureaucratic red tape, even on our side. And that creates a lot of personal frustration when you know you have the right solution. And it almost makes you want to give up and move on. But these things can't set back a team and their development goals. Um, you know what you set out to do. Uh, you have confidence in your team that what you're gonna do is both attainable and it has merit. So you need to lead them to that solution. Um, what you all do is not easy. Know that when you set out to implement a solution and instill that in your team, no matter how big or small that you're, um, of, of an item that you're working on. You've got to have that mentality and you've got to instill that into your team. So a little bit about looking forward and finally, so what are you anticipating over the horizon to ensure that it doesn't come screaming over you so fast that you can't grab it and say, I, I anticipated you and I'm gonna take you head on. Um, what can you do to, to affect that? So we've, this week has been pretty eye-opening on what you've heard about uh, amazing, amazing advances in the miniaturization of, of all kinds of components that we've now ventured into a new class of what we're calling small sats, cube sats, and even smaller. And what's the ground systems architecture that's gonna support that emerging requirement? We need to take advantage of uh, those technologies that are out there to, while they're miniaturizing things that are going up in space, what can we do on the ground uh, to take advantage of, uh, not make that mission just as expensive as it was before by, with a ground system that has is, that is, is got heritage to it to support the big guys. So, what we've done at Wallops in a smaller sense to adapt to this is we have a 45-foot UHF antenna at Wallops that we're making modifications to and uh, to support a wide variety of CubeSats and SmallSats. And I know that sounds large, but that was a science antenna in the past. A lot of these CubeSats and SmallSats that go up require a lot of uh, uh, receive capability on the ground, especially in launch and early orbit when you can't quite find them. So we're making modifications to that system to provide long-term and automated capability to a, a wide range of customers. So remember to in, you know, implement those adaptive approaches for these unanticipated future needs. <clears throat> so
So Orbital ATK, as most of you know, was awarded a follow-on uh, contract to provide ISS cargo services uh, to the, um, for the International Space Station, and that'll most likely carry them to about 2024. And so remember to architect your systems to support extended life that will be unchanged and approached. Uh, you know, it, you need to maintain the same, same capability, but you also must have the longevity and the reliability not just be able to be scalable. So longevity and reliability on an unanticipated mission extensions is obviously something you need to keep your eye on. Um, finally, and you'll also be getting a call, no doubt, in your development program about something you never even had on your thought list. Um, but that's okay. You need, to, you need to take that. For example, we're looking at a potential U.S. Navy Global Hawk customer at Wallops. And, you know, we can fit it in. It's not a NASA mission. Um, but we can fit it on our plate and, and support that mission well. And, um, but that's what we're here for. And uh, you need to uh, take that in your, mission de in your uh, systems development activities and think of it the same way. Can you absorb that one that you didn't see coming and do it because it's the right thing to do and because it becomes an, a very effective solution in the end? Um, you know, use of successful approaches that work for you, use those successful approaches that work for your last challenge. Learn from those and keep using them. Uh, propose solutions to challenges that uh, also may not, you may not see as, uh, as challenges that we truly should entertain. If you propose the solutions, they may go forward. And as I stated before, make sure those solutions are transparent, accurate, and realistic. That's very important. And for those like my daughters who don't know what that means when I say those things, just make sure it's truthful. Um, your feedback to your customers or your team, if there's truth embedded in it, it's all important. Um, if you aren't truthfully communicating, uh, you're only going to lose those folks that value the opposite, and that's okay. So uh, to sum up, um, again, I want to thank you for letting me talk here a little bit about applying something that's really a little bit different than what you all do, but trying to apply a little bit of the lessons learned and how that may apply to your all, your ground systems architectures, um, how you develop those, how you develop team, how you develop people, and how you develop partnerships. Um, you know, General Greaves mentioned yesterday about um, his personal career growth and the opportunities that were afforded him as he went through his career to get where he's at today. Um, some of you out there will have the opportunity to mentor our next generation of corporate leaders or our next generation of generals. Don't forget that duty that you have. It's just as important. Um, again, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Supposedly, there's a lot of tension between mission assurance and agility, mm -hmm. you know, rap doing things rapidly. And I'm thinking if anybody would have some strong thoughts about that, it would be somebody at a launch range, and especially one like yours, where you're dealing with these quick reaction things that don't involve a five-year campaign, like a lot right. of the big systems that we work on at the Aerospace Corporation and Space and Missile Systems Center. Yeah, very good question. So from a range environment, it's uh, it definitely agility mission assurance, but we have that one other component, and that's called range safety. So in my world on the range side, I don't run the safety organization. Wish I could, but I don't. And so there's always a great balance between what the safety office feels is relevant, and that's, that's the key word, what they feel is relevant, and also what they feel is practical for the mission. They don't care whether we're launching a sounding rocket or whether we're launching a balloon, or we're launching an expendable launch vehicle with a bunch of VIPs there in attendance, launching cargo to the International Space Station. They have communicated their requirement, and that we have to set to that. Now the agility part has to come with, okay, we know that's a given going into the project. So we have to develop our approaches, whether that be project management approaches or whether that be technical approaches to systems development. We have to develop those approaches with that known going in. So that's not a risk. That's not a risk. That's a known requirement. So yeah, it's, it's uh, much different at Wallops now with systems development because we are a test range and we cannot allow uh, 
something like the expendable launch vehicle of the Antares launch vehicle to cause wallops to become the eastern range or the western range. We want to complement them. We do not want to be the eastern range of the north. Um, so that's, a, that's probably our biggest challenge is to, to enable ourselves to be responsive to our uh, DOD and NASA customers that want to come there and get out in a week with the right project management and safety processes wrapped around that in addition uh, to conducting something as large as an Antares mission in the background. Uh, we're doing that well so far. We were able to turn uh, around our entire range from an Antares mission uh, back in early 2014 to a sounding rocket on the next day, which hopefully proved that we can maintain that agility. Um, I can tell you while I'm there, we, we will not lose focus on the test and training requirement that the nation has. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.